I'm here today with Haythrun and I, who are both Generation Xers, and what we're doing is talking about some of the unique challenges that people in Generation X are facing. Uh, we are a group of people, just to make sure we're all on the same page here. Right now, we're about 39 to 54 years old, and we're specifically talking about Generation Xers that were higher IQ, uh, that were raised by boomer parents. Uh, a lot of these people, a lot of us, are red pilled at a very late age. We got red pilled in our you know, 30s, 40s, even 50s sometimes. And we're facing some unique challenges. So a lot of people are talking about the millennials as a lost generation. And certainly they've been raised to be snowflakes. They have a lot of their own issues, but Generation X is truly the lost generation uh, of what, what we currently have in existence. The reason being is that we went through the very first generation of perfected programming the programming that we went through was at the highest level it had ever been. And we had, when we were younger, we had no anti-programming. We had no alternative. There was no internet that we could go to. There was no subversive channels we could find out the truth from. And there was no uh, right or left wing um, alternative to the mainstream programming. And so we were programmed very, very efficiently. And I'm talking today with Haythrin about some of the problems that we face as Generation Xers and what we can do about them. Welcome. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm really glad you posed these questions to me. These, these are questions that I, I do get in coaching and I think they're so common uh, that it's worth making a video just about it. We're gonna be specifically talking to higher IQ Generation Xers, uh, but a lot of these questions affect all kinds of Generation Xers it's just that the lower IQ ones may not, they may still be under the programming. They may not have got the red pill yet. It tends to be, I think getting red pill has some connection with IQ. Um, what, what, and we're gonna define the red pill as being willing to look at the truth no matter what. It's, it's a, really a matrix type of red pill, you know? If you're gonna take the red pill and see reality or the blue pill and forget reality. And we've chosen to take the red pill. And I do think that has something to do uh, with intelligence and perhaps also since they're not all smart people took the red pill I think it also has to do with our willingness to face social ostracism rather than face our own condemnation for sticking with blue pill lies and you have, you brought up some really great questions would you like to pick one in particular that we can start the conversation with uh, let me pull up my notes so that I'm on the same page with you um, some of these questions actually came out of a little think tank that I put together over the weekend in preparation for this discussion. So uh, I can't take credit, credit for these questions. They came out of the group conversation with others. Uh, one of the questions was, what is the utility of sexual market value for somebody who, for whatever reason, is not going to reproduce? And uh, a couple of these questions hinge on that. And I think that's because for Generation Xers, uh, who did not reproduce, again, for whatever reason, um, you know, we are looking for uh, an alternative to the traditional family um, to provide for our emotional, social, economic needs, elder care needs, legacy needs. And um, yeah, I think it's a, an important question that one of the folks in the think tank put forward. Yeah, that's a good question. So the sexual market is primarily about reproduction. But that's not the only thing that's about. If it was, then, you know, for example, gay people uh, wouldn't have sex. If sex was only about reproduction, there are other needs that are fulfilled as well by having an interest in having sexual market value. Uh, a lot of the things that are connected with having sexual market value are also connected with simply taking good care of yourself. Uh, for example, if you're fit and healthy, you'll have a higher sexual market value, but you're also going to have a better quality of life as well. You're going to have less health care costs. You're going to have uh, a, a better old age. You know, it, you can really abuse yourself until you get <laughs> about our age. And then you feel it. You know, you pay for every, every mistake you made when you were younger, when you get into your 40s and 50s. And you have to start taking care of yourself. And so even if you're not doing it specifically to raise your sexual market value, it's going to have benefits for you. And I would say the same thing when it comes to... Uh, especially for men when it comes to uh, career, when it comes to 
uh, choosing a, a friend group because your friends have a big impact on your sexual market value. A person with no friends who wants to date such a person, you know, if they can't make friends, they probably aren't going to make a good uh, re relationship partner either. So That's looking true. after our SMV, it's just generally good for us as people. Yeah, women look for that. I mean, I can tell you as a woman that um, one of the things that we look for uh, in a male partner is his social credit. You know, who does he associate with? What are the quality of those people? And where does he rank in that hierarchy? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, I, I tell a lot of men who are looking for a woman, the very first thing I tell them is get into a male hierarchy. Uh, the younger they are, the more important this is to get into it quickly. Uh, but get into a male hierarchy and figure out what the successful men in that hierarchy are doing and do basically what they're doing. You know, and I don't mean the exact jobs or whatever, but follow the pattern of life that these successful people in your hierarchy are doing. Um, it's very hard. You know, if you can't make a friend, how on earth are you going to make a relationship with someone of the opposite sex? If you can't make friends with someone of the same sex as you, you know, where you already right. have a whole bunch of built in similarities. Right. So no, I think it's, it's not just a matter of looking at it as sexual market. Um, there's a huge overlap between being a healthy, happy person and having high sexual market value. Uh, it's just a way that we use to describe those traits in, in a group applied towards reproduction. But the, the actual work that you have to do to get a high sexual market value makes your life better, even if you don't. Uh, even if you aren't in a relationship or looking for one. And I'm actually surprised there's a lot of people, uh, I see this quite often, they are, they're past relationships in a way. They, they're frustrated. They're exhausted of looking. Oh, yes. And they, they just, they don't want to have their heart broken again. And it's, it's sad. It's, it's really hard uh, to, to hear people that have been beaten down like that. And that makes it very, very difficult for them because they will start to isolate themselves, not just from potential mates, but from friends and from everyone. I think Generation X is the first isolated generation. The boomers, boomers are extremely networked. Yes. These are the people that in the hippie days, they would go on, you know, pile 16 of them into a bus and go on a long trip for months at a time. They were extremely socialized. Their children, however, are very unsocialized. Generation Xers have very few friends, I would say probably the group with the least amount of friends. And they are very isolated from each other. And this is a lot to do with the way that they were raised. Uh, they were raised right. with a lot of parental control on them. Uh, well, we were the latchkey kids. And uh, I mean, I would say that for most of us, uh, we were underprotected. You know, mm -hmm. our parents had the highest rate of divorce uh, of any of the recent generations. So we were left home alone. You know, moms were working. Dads were not in the household because they had separated. Uh, so, yeah, we learned how to be independent in a way in that we occupied ourselves but there's a negative to that you know we we developed um sort of very primal survival instincts and habits but we weren't socialized uh we weren't supervised we didn't receive any mentoring or guidance so when we entered into adulthood we really didn't have a map to navigate the landscape by or worse than that uh, we were given a map that was incorrect you know if we had parents that um, uh, for whatever reason uh, distorted truths for us uh, manipulated us in, in some way exploited abused etc we went out there with a map that, that was completely incorrect and, and not useful and even harmful so yeah I think that sets one up for getting into situations where they're going to have negative relationships where they're going to experience failures uh, in all facets of life. And yeah, that, that it, it exacts a cost. Every time you fail, that exacts a cost. And after so many successive failures, you just run out of energy um, to, to continue. You may want to, but it, it exhausts you sort of psychically to the point where your brain learns, don't do that again because we need to survive and, and that is costing us resources. And we have to see, too, a lot of this comes from the general behavior trends of the boomers. The boomers are parasitical. Uh, they sucked all the money out of their parents' generation, and then they 
sucked all the money out of their own generation and then they spent all the money from their children's generation and they not only did that with money they did that with everything um, yes there was i think the first generation where children were a considered an accessory rather than you know i'm having children for purely for my sake rather than the fact that i want to um no par parental interest in having children for their own sake uh is part uh, and is, is perfectly healthy as part of having, being a parent um, but it was the first generation where they thought I can use up my children. It doesn't matter. And that, that really left a lot of scars on the generation Xers. Um, the, the relationship that you have with your parents sets the pattern for relationships that you have the rest of your life. And if you're dumped in daycare at an early age, if you're home alone all the time, uh, you just don't find you don't need people. And people who have been raised in communities where people cooperate a lot, so folkish type communities, um, even people I know, for example, uh, uh, a client of mine was raised in a, a American Irish community where people were always together all the time. And he says he likes to do everything in a group. He prefers groups. He, he wants to learn something, he prefers to learn it in a group. He wants to uh, get his help for something, he prefers to do it in a group because they, were, they have that community of support Whereas the vast majority of Generation Xers have had no support. And when you have to do everything on your own, you learn to survive, but you don't learn to thrive. Exactly. Yeah, very well put. And that defines Generation X. Certainly the peers uh, that I'm in contact with and that I've known over the years, uh, a lot of us have described ourselves as feeling like war veterans, uh, you know, that uh, we've had to survive you know, a high predation environment where we've had to expend a lot of resources and incur a lot of damage, but without access to good opportunities really for anything. And one of the things that I wanted to add uh, when you were speaking earlier uh, about strategies and, and whatnot, um, not only did many of us not receive useful strategies or, as I said, perhaps even harmful ones, but the markets themselves had been destroyed by the boomers. So by the time Gen Xers you know, came to adulthood, we were entering into a marriage market that was completely destroyed and we were entering into a work market that was completely destroyed. So let's say for example, um, and I'll use a, a young woman uh, for this, uh, let's say she got lucky and, you know, she grew up in an environment where mom and dad were married, they were healthy, they modeled healthy pro-social behavior for her. And as a young woman, she aspires to be a wife and mother because that's what she's biologically called to do. Well, she's going to have a really hard time selling her value because sex is so cheap and, and freely available by all of the other young women who have been programmed uh, to be promiscuous. And so finding a man, you know, at the peak of her sexual market value uh, to, to pair bond with and start a family with now becomes a virtually impossible task because, you know, the guys expect free sex. They expect sex outside of commitment. They won't date you unless you're open to that. So it, it destroys the value, you know, for her. Um, same thing for the guys, you know, they're, they're having a, a conservative man who, you know, was raised in a pro-social environment. He's looking for a wife to pair bond with. He, he's faced with the same problem. How do I find that needle in the haystack, you know? Um, and granted, not everybody is called to a traditional family. I mean, I'm, I'm an outlier myself, um, but that's because I'm a creative person and I was always passionate about the arts. I have a high talent for the arts and that's what consumed my interest as a child. Um, but for the majority, you know, I'd, I'd say probably 80, 90% of the population, that's what they're biologically hardwired to seek. And um, yeah, between the programming, the sort of maladaptive parenting that they got, and then coming into markets that were completely stripped of their value, I mean, our generation was faced with a near impossible task in terms of success. And I think we've been really hard on ourselves up until we got red pilled. You know, one of the positives from the red pill is now that we understand the causes for these consequences, it takes a little bit of the pressure off of us for, for failing. We realize now 
this wasn't entire, entirely our fault. And we really didn't, to use a word that you use a lot, have agency up until now because we were ignorant. You know? Yeah, we're, we're, we're largely under, um, until you take the red pill, you're largely under the control of the programming that society gives to you. And even after you take the red pill, you might know the truth, but the programming doesn't evaporate instantaneously. We're not a computer. We can't be instantly programmed. It takes, sometimes for some people, it takes years to reprogram, to get out of uh, self-destructive mindsets and self-destructive frames. It's interesting you mentioned consequences, and I think this is part of, part of the problem. The boomers, they said, oh, you can act like a selfish prick all your life, and everything turns out fine. Look what happened for me. And then they, they say to their kids, yeah, yeah, you can do whatever you want. You're gonna, you, 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 you can be just as irresponsible as me, but how come things aren't going to turn out? So what, what's wrong with you? You know, it's, they've already burnt the house down and the fields and everything else around us. And they're going, well, why can't you also consume everything like locusts? Right. Well, there's nothing left. Done. You've already stripped everything, burnt everything. There's nothing left for us. And so, right. We, we, we not only couldn't show their level of, of um, selfishness, we couldn't even show their parents' level of selfishness. Everyone's a little selfish, so we couldn't even show their parents' level of selfishness. We are the generation that is sacrificing to try to bring things back to normal for the future. And we're doing that because that's just the, that's the position we got put in, you know, just like the first and second World War generation, they were put into a situation where they had young men had to go to war. Uh, we had to go to war against the selfishness of our boomer parents. And so this is really uh, a difficult thing, I think, for millennials to even understand how, I mean, millennials are pretty good about calling out boomers, um, but they're calling them out from a distance. And we saw it up close. Right. And that's a big difference, and that leaves scars. And that, uh, for a lot of Gen Xers, I don't think they have really come to, to grips with the damage that was done by the previous generation in particular. Uh, the boomers themselves are the product of their parents allowing them to be brainwashed by media as well and, and not having consequences. Uh, their parents never imposed consequences on them, and therefore they never ended up understanding that the big problem you talk to boomers is is they don't understand there's consequences for any behavior correct uh that is their the, if, if you want to describe boomers in the simplest way it's people with no consequences for their behaviors and it's not that there's no consequence it's that they're not paying the consequence they've been parasitical to the following generations and the, i i do feel bad for millennials because it's not like things have gotten a lot better since we were younger but at least the truth is more easy to find. Yes, I would say that two of the advantages that millennials have over Gen Xers is one, they still have their youth. So there's potential there that can still be salvaged. And secondly, as you said, they have access to information. Uh, that's something that Gen X did not have. So uh, yeah, to that extent, many of them, again, if they're high IQ or they just have the courage you know, to, to look for answers to their problems. Um, they're going to be able to find that knowledge now because it is available on the internet and they can recover their lives. And in many cases, I think go on to still have, you know, full rich lives. Uh, whereas Gen X, there's few options available to us. Um, I know I wrote a pretty impassioned paragraph to you, uh, in my summary about, uh, you know, ask an Xer, uh, you know, about their experience. And um, actually, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read that because I, I, th I think a lot of, of Xers in this situation will resonate with this. Um, ask an Xer who grew up in a broken home with an absent father and narcissistic mother and was mandated to perform and achieve with insufficient investment, only to find himself plunged into an adulthood where marriage and family were unattainable, economic hardship unavoidable, and the need to adapt to a job market that afforded no stability constant. And you will hear the voice of someone who is frustrated, confused, angry, and pessimistic, but most of all, exhausted and unmotivated. And I yeah, think that, that really that sums it up. That exhausted and unmotivated is, um, you know, it, it is natural 
that when you attempt to do something several times and it doesn't work out the way you want, it's natural to become demotivated. That's your mind's way of saying that that's probably not a good idea. You know, um, I think it was Einstein that said uh, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again when it doesn't work, you know, the, making the same mistake over and over again. And yes. as for a lot of, um, for a lot of, of the generation Xers though, I think when they, when they look at what they were doing, now we have to remember, even if you took the red pill, you can still be largely under the programming that you received before you became uh, red pilled. You, you might still be operating under that. So you can know something is true. So I, I talk sometimes to people and I'll explain, you, you understand that this is how women think in general, for example. And they'll say, I know that is a fact, but it's so hard to accept it. And I think a lot of the red pills are like that. I know it as a fact, so I know it intellectually, but it hasn't yet sunk down into my heart and the heart is the seed of motivation. So you end up um, repeating mistakes that you know and, and it's even worse when you know that you know are not the right way to to proceed, and that makes it especially frustrating because you think like now I know the truth I should be able to be successful at what I'm doing, and you still find yourself with the same same difficulty in being successful. And I think for a lot of a lot of Generation Xers they really need to detox from all of the the garbage that was spewed upon them, you know all of the, yeah. the propaganda. And that detox isn't just now I know the truth. The truth it takes time. Better. It takes time. Yeah. And you need to take specific steps to clean your mind out from that stuff. Um, one of the, the things I do in the course that I teach on agency is I encourage people to write down the programming that they're operating under. And this can, this can end up being quite a big list. Um, I'll give you an example. So you're an artist mm -hmm. and you're an artist mostly in a visual medium. Well, you also, know. also music. I'm, yeah. Oh, and music. <laughs> yeah. oh, and music. Do you, do you play an instrument? I'm a singer and a songwriter. Uh, I do have two music projects that I'm currently working on. That's my passion. I, I do uh, graphic design as my day job, sort of. Oh, speak, excellent. So, excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so in your music, when you sing, we'll talk about a trained voice. So you, if you, if you have a trained voice, you have programmed yourself to sit in a certain way to breathe in a certain way and to move your body in a certain way to think about the music in a certain way and you don't need to think about the details while you're singing correct if you're trained properly it just kind of it's it's natural it comes out naturally now can you imagine if you took someone and you trained them wrong on purpose as a joke and uh this individual now you they, they're trying to learn how to sing it's going to be a lot harder for that individual to learn to sing than someone that knows nothing and you start with them. Right, that's like I was saying earlier, um, you know, a, a child, for example, uh, who didn't receive any useful inf information from his parents, but at least was not abused, uh, that child, even though they're disadvantaged, they're in a better position than the child who was lied to and gaslit uh, and manipulated and used because they now have a map that is they, they think they have a map that's going to serve them but actually it, it's maligned and they now have to unlearn all of that they have to throw the map away try to forget everything that they know and and learn correct strategies that are going to serve them and there is a process to that and in the process is very similar to the one uh where you learn to sing in the first place or you learn to play an instrument or you learn to play a sport, um, normally you will start, for example, I'll give you a very simple example. I'm te when I teach my son in the very first time how to clean up his toys, uh, I would say, I don't say to him, go clean up your toys. It's too complex. That concept is too complex. You know, you wouldn't say to someone, um, you know, go play guitar. You say, okay, first I say to him, come here. So he comes over to me. That he understands that level of instruction. And then I'll say, pick up that toy and he picks it up and I say, walk over to the box. He walks over to the box. Now put the toy in the box, puts the toy in the box. I said, now you cleaned up one toy. If you keep doing that, you've cleaned up your toys. Oh, okay. But he still needs a couple more times. I explain to him each, each time at the beginning. So it re, re uh, structures his brain to understand that when I say 
clean up your toys, it means this whole series of subroutines. And every skill is learned that way. Um, it's, Jean Piaget calls it constructivism. Uh, Jean Piaget uh, started with the constructivism and it was um, Samuel Papert that uh, progressed, it, progressed that, um, uh, that research in, in learning to basically say that what we do is we construct our understanding of the world one tiny subroutine at a time. And then we put those subroutines all together to figure out complex uh, tasks that we have to do. Right. So Jordan Peterson has made a, a very similar or perhaps the same observation. I, I recall yeah, I think this. Quoting, yeah. quoting the, um, probably quoting from, from those. Those are the two main uh, ones that, that researched this in the 20th century. Okay. Uh, up in, I think, Papert died a couple of years ago. And the interesting thing about it, it's, it's definitely worth reading anyone who is involved in any kind of education reading uh, the book Constructivism. I think that's what it's called from Samuel Papert. Uh, it, it, no, Mindstorm, sorry, is, is another good one, talking about how we construct from basically a, a confusion of information. We pick out things that are it, we're able to understand, and bit by bit we build on that until we've built a complete layer of understanding of something. I think we need to take the things that we are having trouble with. So if we're having trouble with uh, relationships with um, uh, the opposite sex, so we're having trouble with romantic, I don't like to call them romantic because... Romantic is, it has its own connotations, but if we're having trouble with relationships, we can't, we're not going to fix one little thing. We have to deconstruct how we are handling relationships. So what are we doing? Where, where are we looking for potential mates? How are we approaching them? How are we vetting them? Um, how are we appearing to the mate? Like what messages are we sending by how we dress and how we act? And look up on how are we resolving conflicts with them and look at this entire uh, palette of things that we're doing and start to break each one of those down into smaller bits and see where the maladaptive programming is somewhere in what we're doing. And, and it's, once you start getting into the process of it, it can become fairly obvious where the maladaption is. And it's usually quite early on in the process. It's very often in the, where do am I looking for a spouse? You know? Okay. I'm not finding what I'm looking for because I'm looking in the wrong place. And then I get someone who's unsuitable and then I try this process to fix them so that it'll make a good relationship. But none of that would have been necessary if we were looking in the right place for the right person at the right time. And so if we break all of that down, we, we, we can start reprogramming ourselves. So if we realize that a certain aspect of what we're doing is maladaptive, we start to tell us, explain to ourselves, this sounds weird talking to yourself, but it's, it's very effective for reprogramming your own mind and tell ourselves, I will not, I, I date people at work and then we break up and then I get fired because it makes a horrible situation. And that's happened five times in a row. I've had people tell me this. And I said, well, do you ever think about not dating people at work? But where else <laughs> am I gonna meet someone? I think you're going to have to figure it out because that's obviously not working, right? Uh, although that, that can be a good place to meet people for some, if you're in a big enough company that they're not directly working with you. But um, right. Well, I mean, you touch on a point that I think affects, I mean, both millennials and Gen, Gen Xers, and that's that because of the internet and social media, which I think in many ways is a plague, um, people don't go out anymore. I mean, I can tell you, I mean, I'm in my 40s, and when I was young, people still went out. They would still meet at pubs or, I mean, when I was a teenager, they'd meet at the mall. Um, but, but people would go out into the, the neighborhood, into the society, and they would get together and they would actually have activities and engage one another. And nowadays, I mean, I can tell you, it has been like pulling teeth to try to get anybody to leave their house. Um, just just to grab a drink and hang out. I mean, it is really bad. And I, I know I personally have suffered a great deal of social isolation, even though I've made an effort to, to push against that, be, again, because the market has been destroyed. People are not as available for socialization as they used to be. Here's a key. When you come home from school tonight, there'll be food in the fridge, warm it up, you can play your Nintendo as much as you want. Make sure you get your homework done. And uh, I'll be home, but you need to be in bed by nine. I'm going to be home around 11. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and you're going to do this all by yourself because we weren't, we weren't smart enough to have some siblings for you. Uh, you know, although, although a lot of generation extras do have siblings, but you're, you're going to be doing that. In fact, we're going to get you each a TV so you can watch it in separate rooms because I won't be there to work out any disagreements. So this way you will be completely isolated from each other. I have some observations about Gen Xers with siblings too that yeah. I've seen. Well, and, 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 and if this is your childhood growing up during the formative years where you're learning how to socialize, it's, it's about the equivalent of tying somebody up in a bed for 10 years and then popping them out of the bed and go, run, <laughs> you know? Oh, exactly. Yeah, um, it, it's very disabling. And that's a word that I've used. I mentioned that in some of my comments to you, that a lot of us, if we really take an honest inventory of ourselves, we are currently in a state of disability. We need to be rehabilitated from this. And we don't know how to do it. You know, what, what do you do when your parents and your society as a whole, because we were educated as well in school and by the culture um, in such a way that it has left us disabled? No, I don't and think that when that's... When we were kids, we actually, you know, we thought the government was, the school, we thought the school had good intentions. We thought the programming was actually there to help us. <laughs> um, there, was, there was a time in society when the programming was there. Uh, not just to help us, but to help social cohesion. There was a uh, reciprocal benefits to the programming we got. You know, people would go to church, they learn, don't kill, don't steal, don't cheat. Mm, that sounds like a good idea. I'd like it if people didn't kill me and steal from me and cheat me. And right. uh, so it was, it was mutually reciprocal. And the messages that we got as kids, we still had that same high level of trust. We are a high trust society. We had that high level of trust. And they weren't the same messages that our grandparents got. These were oh, different messages. Yeah. In fact, in many cases, they're exact opposite messages. Yeah, some of the messages that I can recall that are probably still being used today were, if it feels good, do it. Fake it till you make it. I mean, th these, this was the kind of encouragement that we got from our parents. Mm -hmm. th these, this is what we were um, given as, uh, as encouragement. Uh, I, I know that my mother, I mean, to this day, she still tells me, you know, I had to figure things out on my own. You know, you need to figure things out on your own. There Don't was, rely on no man. Uh, yeah, I got that too. I mean, we can talk about that offline, but because I, I want to keep this focused on the group and not myself. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of us just got these messages that were one, very permissive without any indication that there was going to be consequences for that. And that it was okay to misrepresent ourselves to ourselves, to our peers, to the world, just in order to get something, you know, whether it was a job, a relationship, whatever, you know, that fake it till you make it. Um, yeah, it, it was very harmful. Yeah, well, the, the boomers were mostly spineless jellyfish. And so all their advice is spineless jellyfish advice. Mm -hmm. It's all wishy-washy, um, just, you know, don't rock the boat. Uh, just, you know, do, do whatever you ha get along. Was it, uh, get, al go along to get along. This go along. Stuff. Yeah. That was another yeah. one. And it's it, interesting that the, the supposed rebel generation, the hippies were the get along, go along to get along generation. You know, mm -hmm. reality is how many of them were rebelling and how many of them were just following along with the one or two that were rebelling. Right. They were mostly a generation of followers. They were, uh, more than perhaps any other generation. They were subjected to uh, their their own peer pressure, whereas other generations would have had massive amounts of pressure from older generations as well. My uh, you know, my great great grandmother and uh, my great grandmother uh, um, telling me that when she was a little girl, she was raised um, one of sixteen kids, and they had loads of extended family because the generation before them also had you know ten to sixteen kids, and so did the one before that, and so you had. There was always someone or two or three someones within one or two years of you that were your peers for your family. Right. You also had hundreds of older and younger relatives. And so the older ones there, uh, you know, if your parents weren't able to watch you, you'd be at an uncle or aunt's house. Uh, you'd have an older brother. You'd have an older cousin. You'd have somebody always looking out for you. So there was a limit to how much trouble you could get in or how lonely you could be, or how lacking you could be in guidance, your parents could be 
absolutely terrible at parenting, you had like 30 or 40 other adults there that were very closely related to you that you could go and ask questions of. If your parents had some issues in their marriage, that's okay. There's 10 other couples over here that are closely related that you can go to and see good examples. And you'll spend time at their house because they're, you know, your cousins and stuff. So you're going to see these other examples. Right. That responsibility was, was shared and that benefit was shared. Um, you know, that's something that I've observed uh, just trying to, to problem solve, you know, for myself. Okay, well, I'm probably never going to marry at this point. I'm, I, I know I'm not going to have kids, but I need to solve this problem for myself and others and uh, the concept of the tribe, which is essentially what you're describing there. Um, you know, that very effectively uh, solves many of those problems. You've got the wisdom and knowledge of the older generation uh, providing value to, to the younger generation. And then you have the younger generation, you know, they're young and fit and they can provide, you know, physical labor and that sort of thing, uh, providing that value back, you know, and then everybody just sort of pitching in and rolling up their sleeves wherever there's a need, you know, so-and-so just had a baby, she needs help, or, you know, uncle so-and-so is ill, you know, we need to help him. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's an ideal that that all of us really should be aiming for, not just those of us who have to do it out of necessity. I, I think it's something that uh, just makes a family stronger. And that's actually one of the downsides of the nuclear family. I mean, God, I see so many friends and uh, friends of friends who are in, I mean, they're legally married, but I don't consider them married because their be, their relationships are what I call conspiracies of codependence. They're, they're these conspiracies. Roommates to, with occasional benefits. <laughs> exactly. No, you, you hit the nail right on the head. Um, they have engaged in a conspiracy to avoid responsibility. And this is not a marriage. I mean, they're like, well, th this is what I was going to say about Xers who were raised with siblings. Uh, because many of us Xers, I, I would say, are developmentally kind of adolescent, you know, millennials are a little bit more infantile. We're, we're a little older than that. We've got kind of an adolescent level of development. We never fully matured. So we really couldn't enter into the estate of marriage, but yet we wanted the benefits of it. So those of us who were able to attract somebody who was agreeable to cohabitation and, you know, everything that went with that, they entered into these conspiracies and they became codependent and they are roommates or brother and sister maybe because you know they had a brother or sister growing up and their families are in incredibly dysfunctional and and they themselves are dysfunctional and some of them have had children and i mean it's a nightmare watching these kids grow up in these environments um so that was just something else i wanted to touch on and it was i i think you will find the 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 boomers who were least destructive were the ones that uh, were part of non-mainstream uh, cultures, non-mainstream groups, because there was an uh, there was some counter to that mainstream propaganda. So you know, I'll see if they belong to a specific religious group or they belonged to, um, you know, a, a, let's say they were Mennonites, for example. They didn't really get much government programming. So this is not a thing of that just, you know, you're born at that time, you're going to end up turning out this way. This is absolutely something, uh, programming that we received, that if you were programmed, you can be unprogrammed. Yes. And for a lot of, um, a lot of the people, you know, the, some of the people you described that have gotten into these situations, there may be nothing that they can do, not because they can't, but because they won't they're so sufficiently programmed in it that there are sub programs, almost like sub personalities that when they try to separate from their bad behavior, those sub personalities grab them and pull them back in again. Yes. And I've seen this with people trying to get off of um, drugs and alcohol, for example, or even out of relationships that aren't, aren't uh, that are abusive that they will always find something to pull them back in. It should be like, you know, it's easy to break up with that person. You just say, I never want to see you again. And oh, it's emotionally painful, but the actual process is pretty simple. You, you know, I'm never going to see you again. And then you never see them again. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, not if you keep calling them and visiting them. Right. 
Right. And, and the problem is, is that we get, we get pulled back into these bad behaviors because the imprint of the programming is so strong that even though we know that's not what we, sh what we should be doing, it's very easy for us to get drawn back into it again. And you, you were talking about, you mentioned something about um, the difference between triage and, and therapy. Let's see, where was that? Ah. I don't know that I use the word triage, but that's yeah. very apt. Um, yeah, that was, that was, I think, my, my word. Okay, um, but, but no, I, I think, I think that, uh, that's a proper term to use. Um, maybe yeah. because I use the reference of feeling like, you know, soldiers in war or whatnot. Yeah, a lot of us are pretty banged up, you know, we're, we actually are injured in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, eventually getting on the exercise bike and lifting the weights will, will do us some good. But first we have to attend, you know, to the injury. And it's very difficult to find resources uh, in society, at least it has been for me and some of the folks I've talked about. Um, or talked with rather, because uh, traditional therapists, uh, first of all, they're university educated, so there's a lot of leftist programming that that they are operating under, um, which is sometimes you know a problem. But they also just seem to have no skills when it comes well, they're, to they're dealing. Licensed. They're a licensed professional, and mm -hmm. the license exists to prevent competition, and competition is what makes you is one of the main reasons why a market produces excellence. An individual can produce excellence simply because that is in their personality. That's just who they are, their high conscientiousness. But for an entire market to produce excellence, it needs competition. Okay. And with the, the therapy, psychoanalysts, uh, all of that, uh, there, there are basically three big problems. One is that the body of thought from which it comes from is not particularly a Western body of thought. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. too, uh, deeply about that, but uh, no, I think you and I we yeah, speak the same you language. And I, most of our most of our listeners understand that the origins of that are not the origins of which white Western Europeans base their psyche on. Uh, there is there is some there is some uh, compatible uh, psychoanalogy as well, but a lot of it is not compatible with how our brains work, or at Correct. least from, from um, most of our brains and the other other thing is is that since it's taught at schools which have a very political and ideologically narrow viewpoint you have to at least mimic that while you're in the school which is going to leave an imprint on your brain and how you process things and the last is is that it's a licensed um it's a licensed profession and you are you can lose your license for telling the truth if that truth is not previously sanctioned. There are things which a therapist was obligated to tell you 20 years ago that if they told you now, they'd lose their license. The same is true of uh, traditional allopathic medicine too. The doctors, I mean, I had to see a doctor about a physical issue some years ago and he, he was courageous, he was honest with me and he told me, um, you know, there, there are things I suspect are going on with you you know, that, that I'd like to help you with, but I cannot recommend certain forms of treatment because of my license. Neither can I recommend that you see a naturopath or a holist. Like he mentioned, he said these things in such a way. I can't I, recommend you should do this. But. It, exactly. But he was trying to be helpful and thank God he did because that put me on the right path. But yeah, because they're licensed and they're under this mandate, um, Exactly. That's the problem is, is people in our society, we're told if you have an injury or illness, physical or mental, these are the, the people that you go to. But then you go there with this expectation that you're going to be helped and you don't get the help. And then that's you another the failure. You go to and this is the pill you should take. Right, right. And, and then that just adds more frustration because that amounts to another investment without a yield and the brain learns that that's a failure. And it's very, very frustrating. Yeah, I got to the point where um, I don't go to doctors unless I already know what's wrong. And I just go there uh, to tell them what I want them to do uh, because they, they and, and this isn't completely the fault of the doctors either. Uh, you know, a doctor might have 5,000 patients. Sure. And if those patients visit the doctor every couple of months, you know, there'll be some people that are there every week. My wife's pregnant with twins. She's 
at the doctor every single week by their request because of, of it being twins. And that means that, you know, how are they, how on earth can they give any kind of customized care? How can they actually care about you? We call it care. How can they care when they have 5,000 people to take care of? It's not possible. Yeah, they can't. But, you know, and, and, and a lot of the restrictions are, if we look at who, who runs these licensing organizations, they're run by individuals with very specific interests and actual solutions are not their interests. I've been told um, by psychologists to be careful not to give your patient or your, your, the coaching clients too much help in one session because then they won't need to come back for another 10 sessions. Right. And then that just becomes another codependent relationship. So if you've got somebody who uh, has grown up in an, an environment where there's codependency, maybe they're in a codependent relationship right now, either with their parents or with a spouse or what have you. And then they go to a therapist to get what they think is going to be helpful intervention. And it ends up being another codependent relationship. That's a real problem. And, and the, this is, but this is why it's so lucrative. You see, they're programmed to fall into codependent relationships. And if you can get them in a codependent relationship at $250 an hour, which is what a lot of therapists charge, uh, then you can, you can really make a lot of money. You only need a couple of dozen people like that, that you're parasiting off of in order to, to make your money. And I'm not saying all therapists and, and psychologists and psychoanalysts are doing that, but I've had a number of them tell me that's what they're doing. And, yeah. and tell it me in a proud way as if you should do that too. <laughs> you know, as if this was the, the, the standard of care. Uh, you know, I, I was told that at the end of every session, you have to make sure you leave them with some insecurity so that they come back to you next week. Yeah, that, that's a problem with our that. system. Yeah. I can't do that. It makes, it, the concept of that makes me literally ill. Uh, I'm too well, high conscientiousness to, to do that to people. Well, that's good because that means that you're in a position to actually help people. And, you know, there's an God. unlimited supply of people that need help. Why should I, why should I stretch it out with one individual as long as I can? Right, right. The goal should get people, should be to get people mobile and independent and living their lives as quickly as possible. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. just a little callback. We, we uh, use the word triage. So mm, yes, we, I, I, it's interesting you were talking about as if they'd broken their leg and the leg was still broken. And I think for a lot of um, generation Xers, what's happened is a leg broke, it healed wrong. If you don't set a leg after it breaks, so it breaks, if you don't get it set back in the correct way and then it heals, mm -hmm. uh, it's, you'll have a lot of problems. You'll have a lot of pain. You can get infections where the break occurs. And uh, you, the solution to that is the doctor actually has to re-break your bone and reset it again. It's an incredibly painful process. It's worse than breaking your leg in the first place. And uh, I mean, they, they drug you up for it re more recently, but in past history, this happened quite a bit. People live in a remote area, had no access to medical care. They thought they knew how to reset their leg, didn't do a very good job of it. And then they have to get it rebroken uh, and reset again. And <laughs> I think you could hear the neighbors. That, that's, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, they, they would do that. And this is kind of what millennials need. They're going to need. You mean Gen Xers? I'm uh, sorry, the Gen, Gen Xers are going to need, they're going to need a, to, to kind of emotionally re-break their leg again, um, revisit the trauma, figure out what they learned, what, what went wrong from that, but this time put themselves back together properly. The problem with a lot of therapy is they want you to stay forever revisiting the trauma and they never get to the put you back together properly part. Yes. And this is, you know, I, I know people that, I got a letter a little while ago from someone that said two sessions with you was more useful than two years with a therapist. You know, I've gotten the same, not, not that I do coaching because I'm still working on myself. So I don't feel qualified to do that, but what I, I do do intervention. I do help people, you know, become aware and figure out what's going on. I, I have a gift for that. And I've had some folks tell me the same thing. I got more out of 15 minutes talking to you than I have going to therapy for 10 years or 20 years in, in the case of one woman. So yeah, that, that's a valid point to make as well. Well, it's very easy for a therapist to just sit there and listen to you and say, so tell me that story again about your childhood that's painful for you. 
And after a little while, you just get programmed to follow whatever instruction they say, and then they just run you through the cycle of stories over and over again. And uh, that's the story I hear from most people that have been through therapy is it's just re recounting painful stories. That's more like breaking your leg over and over and over again. You know, that's, that's not going to help you heal. Right. Uh, what you want to do is you want to, to have that reset. And then you want to also know how not to break it again in the next time. Because a lot of the, a lot of the problems we're having as adults are recreations of our childhood traumas. We have problems with relationships because we were too alone as children. So what do we do? We isolate ourselves as adults. We intentionally, and I, I, I know this from, from I, I didn't do this, but I know this from other people my age, would intentionally create romantic relationships that had no potential for a future. And it was obvious to them and everyone else that's not going to work. Simply because an actual functional relationship was too scary. But they really knew how to run a non-functional relationship. Like they knew exactly how to play that out and they could cope with it. And so they would repeat these non-functional relationships over and over again instead of getting a new relationship. And, you know, by the time they get to this, this was in my 20s, I saw the people doing this. By the time you're in your 40s, you get, you're exhausted of that. Mm -hmm. Done that seven or eight times, you're exhausted. You don't want to do it again. I talked to a client now, he's not in our generation, he's a bit younger, but it was kind of the same way. He's like, I don't want to, I don't want to do this again. And part of the problem is, is, is like I mentioned, it's where we're looking and it's what we're doing. I think for a lot, you know, for a lot of the, the, the generation extras that are past the point where they're going to have a family. Yes. That's a lot of us. In that case, there are two needs you're looking to fill. You're looking to fill your need for friendship and your need for romantic intimacy, for sexual intimacy. Well, I think there's a third. Um, I, I had mentioned um, a legacy, uh, mm -hmm. but also, um, you know, part of it is elder care. You invest in your kids and your kids are supposed to invest in you. So we've just got a lot of gaps to fill that we're going to have to get creative about and, and figure out, well, how do we solve these problems? And I mean, I've had some thoughts on it and I've made some efforts, but I've, I've not gotten success from the market. We'll put it that way. Um, we were talking so. about community creation and something that reminded me of something that I've talked to men about specifically, but it works for women as well. And that is the concept of having a blood brother. Uh, mm -hmm. You, you talked about communities where people are, you know, they adopt each other. They're, they're bound together in some sort of a formal relationship uh, where they look out, look out for each other. And the concept of blood brothers is an ancient European concept. This is uh, something which we had um, all throughout Europe. If you read some of the old sagas from Northern Europe, they, they, re, they recall that. Uh, I have. I'm a, I'm a Germanic heathen, so this is something I'm intimately yes. familiar with. And Exactly. Um, yeah, just to interject briefly, that is exactly the type of work that I have been involved in off and on since I became a heathen, which was like 15 years ago, or actually longer than that. Um, the challenge that I've had and that some of my colleagues have had, there's actually a gentleman who I'm good friends with who's also heathen, and he's been trying to do the same thing, and we've both been unsuccessful at it, um, is that although we put in the effort and investment to, you know, outreach, meet people in real life, you know, whether it's at a pub or whatever, and try to engage them and say, hey, look, the, look, this is what we're trying to do, and this is why we're doing it, and here's the benefits, and we don't get investment. We, we get people um, who I think in a lot of cases, they're lost children just looking for a home and they don't have anything to bring to the table. And I think instinctively they know that because they have so much self-work to do. They're literally looking more for a, a parental figure to sort of just take them in and, and take care of them as opposed to being a partner. Uh, so we've encountered a lot of that. And then we've just encountered a lot of people who say, yeah, I want this. I want to have a tribe. I want to be part of a landed community. And they, they just don't show up for the work, you know. So I don't know if you have any suggestions as to where folks like us could try to meet people, because I think we've exhausted, between my friend and I, I think we've exhausted the heathen community here in the United States, because um, we've worked locally, regionally, and nationally, and we have failed on all three fronts and online. Uh, we were doing networking online as well, and that failed as well. So I'm, 
I'm pretty exhausted myself, and I know he is too. This is an excellent topic, and I think that for a lot of the millennials that are, if you're a millennial, I'm sorry, millennial an generation Xer, Xer if that's you're an okay. Xer, you're currently single, or you are married and you have no kids and no prospect of children, uh, and if you're over forty, uh, it's almost all of us. I mean, I'm, I'm my wife's pregnant, but this will be our last run, last go at it. Um, for a lot of a lot of us, there there is no chance for children. Uh, in that case, this this sub this subject we're talking about now is extremely important for you. Uh, you do not want to grow old and alone in an increasingly multicultural society um, where nobody cares for you when you get older. That's not a way to grow old. That's that's terrible. And we see what's already happening to boomers. Uh, who didn't look after their kids and have been abandoned by them because they abandoned their kids, their kids abandoned them, and right. they're in old age homes and they're being abused. Yeah, we see that and we don't want that to happen to us. And, and exactly. we recognize, um, you know, what happened to us may not have been our fault, but it is our problem to solve because nobody else is going to solve it for us. Um, and I recognized this quite a while ago. That's why I started, uh, you know, seeking to build a tribe because I recognize this is a problem I need to solve for myself. And I recognize that around age 30, which was when I uh, both kind of got exhausted in terms of trying to find a boyfriend <laughs> who wasn't, you know, a codependent. And also um, I got into heathenry at that time. So the, the two needs just kind of dovetailed on each other. And I began to actively seek for that, but I have not yet found it. Um, well, there aren't the problem with community there is active forces trying to break up any community that is white yes and so if you're a white person and that's the kind of community you prefer uh it's very hard you know if you're asian and you talk about community you kind of take it for granted because wherever you go that there's a sizable population of asians you will have a pretty strong asian community and as long as you're willing to meet their basic social expectations, you can get into that community. Um, now, people will complain, oh, the community is this way, the community is that way. They don't like the details, but they have a community. Right. You know, they, they may not like the details of it, but they have one. Uh, same if, if any, any non, non-white group. And so you're always going to have that force working against you. And it doesn't, it doesn't just work externally. It works in the hearts and minds of all the people who have been propagandized to think that any gathering of three or more white people is a neo-Nazi rally. Right. And so what, one of the things that will over, and the other, the other problem is, is that uh, there is a lack of leadership. Um, white, we, we are very isolated one from the other, and that gives us very little opportunity to practice leadership skills. Now you and, and your other, your friend that you mentioned, you have tried mm -hmm. to create communities and Historically, the way that these communities were created that was successful is that there was something of value that was provided, but in exchange for that, you had to have a buy-in. Uh, an example is the manorial system. So the yes. Lord would be granted a manor, you know, thousand acres, let's say, and he has he needs you know two hundred people to work that. Well, two hundred that's including kids, but there needs to be two hundred, three hundred people there. Excuse me. So he would go and he would recruit people and he would say to them, uh, you're going to get a house. You're going to buy in early. And because you're buying in early, uh, there's no houses yet. So you're going to have to, first thing you have to do is buy a house, build a house. But that means you get to choose the house you want, the location you want or whatever. So he, there'd be something that would, they would be given and they'd have to buy in. They want to walk away. They walk away from all their investment. Everything they put in the community stays in the community. They walk away. They stay there. They get to keep using that. When they're old, uh, there was very common, there was, there was a certain kind of oath that a Lord would swear to one of his vassals that was basically, you will always have a seat at my table is what it meant. Yeah, the hold oath. Mm -hmm. yes. That's what it was called. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, thank you. very. I, I'm, I'm glad you know the proper name. Today. So there was, an, there was a, that hold, hold oath that no matter what happened, you stick by me. You're always going to eat. You're always going to have a warm place to, to lay your head. And when you're old, there'll be someone to take care of you. Right. This is something that I've tried to uh, impress upon those who I've talked with, you know, at moots and what we call the moots, that's the old English, um, for people who've responded to our outreach, um, you know, that essentially adoption 
it wouldn't be a hold oath so much because you know I'm, neither I nor my colleague is setting ourselves up as a lord. We're not qualified to do that. But we've explained that you know there's a, a law of reciprocity here. So if we give you something of value, and right now what I can give of value more than anything is my wisdom and knowledge, and and that's what I do. There's an expectation that they're going to give in kind. And uh, what's been disappointing is we haven't gotten that return gift. My colleague and I, we're, we're you know, we're both, he's a fifth key, I'm a fulfa within our, our Germanic tradition, which basically means, you know, wise man, wise woman. So we, we have a lot of wisdom and knowledge to offer, both temporal and spiritual, but a lot of these folks just kind of show for the free food, so to speak, and then, and then leave. And so it's been really difficult. Um, you, you have to make them buy in before they get anything. Right. This will weed out the people. Um, okay. I'll give you an example. There's some Catholic groups in Spain. You want to join the group? It's a $5,000 fee up front. There's no refunds. You don't like the group. You, you, you show up once, you don't like the group. You don't keep get your 5000 back. Okay, now here, here's a thought. I know we're like into our second hour here, but I'm glad we're, we've moved from talking about the problem and we're now talking about solutions because this, this is really the meat that, that people are going to want to hear and need to hear. Okay, let's say you're an Xer who is exhausted. Okay, uh, financially you're not in a good place. Maybe you've suffered uh, one or two divorces or you know, just, just a con you're, you're just a, a casualty of the job market, which has been very bad for Xers for three decades now. Um, so you don't have a lot of resources, maybe, maybe no resources at all, resources at all. I know some people who are in bankruptcy right now. Um, you're on your own. Uh, you, you may have some skills to bring to the table. You may have some labor you can bring to the table or, or knowledge or wisdom, but how, how does one go about building a manor as you have described it and that's a great reference uh, a landed community where everybody's got some buy-in i mean that's a tremendous enterprise and i think it's a dream for many of us we've talked about it but from a practical standpoint given where we are and what needs to happen in order to get in order to get to the point where we could acquire the land and and build the buildings i mean how do we get from point a to point b is, is essentially what i'm asking yeah the the first thing that i would do the very first thing is um, you need a couple of people. You don't need many for this is to form a nonprofit religious charity. Okay. And that's going to be your body, which manages everything. That's the legal entity, which manages everything. Um, and if anyone, if there is an oath to be signed, it's to that body. It's not, it's, it's to the individuals as well, but for the legal reasons, it's to the body. Um, if there's finances to be collected, it's collected through the body. In the U.S., uh, since you're, you're living in the U.S., correct? Yes, that's correct. So because you're living in the U.S., um, these charities are incredibly powerful. They have a lot of uh, ability to uh, – they're immune from taxation. They're immune from certain uh, requirements, other requirements as well. So that if, even if you get a piece of land, for example, you're not paying land tax. Um, mm -hmm. if you, you know, if you, uh, collect money from people, you you don't have to pay taxes on it. Now I would still encourage a high level of transparency inside the group. Uh, otherwise you, you invite corruption, but that's sure. the first thing that I would do. And I would try to figure out what you're bringing to the table and what that actually is worth. And then say, you know, we're, we're going to, our goal is three phases. We're going to recruit enough people to get a chunk of land. You know, if we got 10 people together, we can throw down and get a chunk of chunk of land that can be a very small bit of land. And you start, you can always move later. The people are important. The land isn't. And you get a chunk of land with those people and you run it through with actual bylaws. Uh, you can, there, there are organizations that, that have, publicly available examples of the kind of bylaws that you'd want for an organization like this. And as much as possible, people should be responsible for themselves, but there are shared expenses, the commons. Um, you'll hear Kurt do a little talk about the commons. He has probably yes. the best description of what that actually means and how that can be managed and who has what responsibilities in the commons. Uh, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to bring somebody in, for example, example, you bring in a man, 
part of his contribution to the commons is that he will be expected to defend it. If he says, I'm a pacifist, half his value just went out the window. You know, if he's not right. willing to defend the commons, he's, he's basically a child. And, and you would have to say, you know, okay, maybe your buy-in is going to have to be higher. And there'll be people who, you know, may, maybe, maybe you have, not you, you say the person coming in, the, the prospect. Uh, sure. Very much, you know, gangs manage to prospect people in complete poverty and bring them into the gang and make money. Uh, and this is where they're often dealing with very low IQ people. I'm, I'm sure we can do it too. You, you bring in people and you put them to work. Oh, you don't have a lot, you don't have a lot of money for buy. You got to buy in with something. You, right. If you can't scrape together a thousand dollars, maybe you're not the kind of quality that we need inside of our, our group. You're going to make a buy in. We're going to put you to work. You got to figure out how to turn the property profitable. Ideally, you buy something like a farm, a hobby farm, a touristic type destination that can be used and they, they can work there. And you start working it like, um, like the church historically worked it. You know, the church often took in young men and women who didn't have any future prospects or people who'd, you know, they, they'd lost their spouse and children in a plague or something like that. And they were older and they, they couldn't start over again. It was impossible. The church would take them in and would create a situation in which they could earn a survival level of upkeep. And the, the keys to making this work is to be very rigid in making sure people pay their fair share. Make sure people are paying in what they're, they're taking out, that they're acting reciprocally. And that takes some really tough leadership. Like leaders, leaders can't be worried about people liking them. Yeah, th this has been a challenge for us. I mean, everything that you've just outlined, uh, my colleague and I have outlined uh, more or less the same thing. We might not, might not have used the same language, but I mean, this is something that we've thought about and we both come from a Germanic heathen background. So Germanic common law and all of that is something that we're familiar with. So um, we're on board with that. Uh, again, our challenge has been, to, to be blunt, the stock of men available. Um, I, and I think him as well, I, we've both, uh, uh, we've both marketed or rather targeted, um, exclusively men. I mean, I, I really, it's not that I don't have any, I don't have anything against women, but at this level, they're not particularly useful in building, in building this. If you bring uh, in the men first, men, men create civilization. Once it's ready, then women come, come in very, right. you don't well, have to recruit women into this, they'll just appear. <laughs> Right. Well, let me give you a snapshot of, of what has been, at least my experience, is, um, you know, I have recruited uh, young men, typically, who showed a lot of promise, high IQ, industrious, brought some skills, some knowledge, work ethic, etc. I thought, okay, I've got some good guys here. And they've expressed interest, and, you know, they've invested time, and they were single at the time. Then they meet a girl, and the girl is typically, well, I'm not going to say typically, I think in all cases, this has been true. She's been an R selected, mm -hmm. overachieving, you know, and what happens is she gets this guy invested with her and they're either now living together or they're in a marriage or a codependency that, you know, has a ring on it. And now he's no longer available. He's no longer interested. He's now invested with her. And that prospect is either lost or compromised. And I've got to start all over again. He gets dicknapped. He gets dicknapped. Do you, do you know why she won and you guys lost? Well, I, I think I know why she won, but, but not, go ahead. Not just the sex. Not just the sex. Okay. She gave him something he wanted and she demanded something of him. Yes. In fact, I guarantee you she demanded things of him before he ever got anything from her. Yes. You, you have to, I think you're undervaluing what you guys are providing to the group. And if you were to value what you were providing high, at a higher level and say to people, I'm sorry, I can't help you until you buy in. This help is for the people that have committed to the project. If you don't commit, you don't get help. Commit, what do you mean? Oh, I mean, you gotta, you gotta sign this contract of behavior for, for six months, you're gonna join us and we're gonna do certain things. It's not to sign the rest of your life away. I mean, you don't get a job if you don't sign a contract. 
um, you're, you're an entrepreneur, you know, contracts, yes. you sign, you commit first and then you get production. Yes. Now women are experts at getting men to commit to things they don't want to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and, uh, you know, there, there is various levels of persuasion that they have. Um, men who are immune to that kind of manipulation and persuasion end up getting actually the, the best women. Uh, but there's a lot of low quality. I'm so always surprised. I call them number tens. Uh, great big fat woman with a tall, thin guy. And, you know, he, he's relatively decent and she's horrible. And I can't figure out how, how that's possible. I look at the number 10 because she's like this and he's like that. <laughs> um, I, I have, I have a, a thought as to why that is just from my observation of the same thing. Um, these guys, uh, they did not get nurtured uh, by their mothers when they were young. So any woman who gives them any kind of approval and any kind of nurturing, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how awful she might be in other ways. They attach to that because it's, it's a very primal need that they, they need to have fulfilled because it was never fulfilled in childhood. Yeah, yeah, we'll joke with them and we'll say, oh, they're just, they're a bunch of hungry or thirsty guys or whatever. But, you know, the reality is we need to have a little compassion for these people as well. Um, they're, they're operating under some damaged instincts. And yeah. If, and, and they're, um, if you, if you look at their families where they come from, typically it's, um, I call them like the, the alpha girl man child configuration, or you have like an overperforming female and an underperforming male. She, she's the, the one who dominates the household. And a lot of their he's parents the mom have. And he's the child. Exactly. So when you take a look at these guys' history, their, their parents tend to fit that configuration where the woman was in charge. And so uh, they didn't have a strong father figure and they had a, you know, a mother who was perhaps controlling or aloof or cold or what have you. And so they're desperately craving some healthy maternal nurturing that they didn't get. And that's, that's how they get trapped. You know? with, with our ancestors, um, women would raise children until the age of six or seven, depending where they were. And after mm -hmm. that, they went off with their fathers. And that transition from um, mother's uh, hanging around mother's apron to father's, uh, you know, tools and work clothes and smashing things or whatever he happened to be doing at the, you know, hammering at the blacksmith or growing something in a field, working with other men uh, and whatnot. That was a difficult transition for children. You know, the yeah. being around mom, there's, there's the nurture, there's, it's kind of a magical, uh, un unrealistic romantic setting. Uh, it's great for little kids. The problem is nowadays there will be men who end up doing that until they're like 28 and then they leave home. Yes. Yeah. You know, or maybe they never leave home. Maybe they're still living with their parents. I've, I've seen a lot that literally transition from living at home with a controlling mother to moving in with and or, you know, in scare quotes, marrying a, a controlling wife who is just, she's just his mother. It, it's the same the same dynamics going on. There's no partnership there. She's the mom and, and he's the little boy. So she ends up assuming all the responsibility for the relationship. And I know one case in which she actually proposed to him, like she bought her own, she bought her own ring. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it happens. <laughs> I, I let my oh. wife, I let my wife set the, um, within the parameters that I agreed to between this weekend and this weekend, you can choose a weekend we're getting married on. <laughs> and that was no, the extent of it. You know? No, no. In this case, she and actually, your own dress. <laughs> yeah. But it no, she, be nice. she purchased her own ring and presented it to him, you know, with her expectations. So yeah, some strange things happen. Why, why didn't he wear the ring then? I mean, that would have, she bought it for herself. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think, I think in this case, I'm not going to say too much because you know, people's personal lives but i i think that um she wasn't obviously looking for a husband she was looking for somebody to play a role in her particular fantasy of you well, know what life was going to be donor she probably wanted kids and she needed a sperm donor and well she if she did she better if the sperm donor hung around if she did she wasn't transparent about that because they both claimed that they agreed not to have children and they both understood that they were sterile when they got pregnant mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. somebody wasn't being honest <laughs> Yeah, it's what ends up happening in these cases is if a woman treats a man like a child, like her child, uh, she's going to lose all sexual interest in him very quickly. 
So yes. it's possible he was sterile when she got pregnant. Mm. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's, you know, these are the kind of things we get into when our programming around relationships is unhealthy. You know, right. he, her programming was unhealthy just as much as his was, you know, both to blame in this situation. But it's, as far as getting people to commit, you have to make people commit earlier on and how do we, something of value. How do we find those people? I mean, I'm really at a loss as to where to cast the net to, to find those people. And I think my, my friend would say the same thing. What ends up happening, I'll, I'll give you an example. So there was a time before, you know, I used to do business coaching only. I was like, I'm not going to help people with their lives. I don't want to hear about their problems. You know, <laughs> I, I like people. And I'd help friends. I helped a lot of friends, hundreds of friends. Um, that's how I honed my skills of being a coach. But I didn't think there was really any business in that. But what ended up happening was um, when I don't charge, I didn't have any clients. But I had tons and tons of people asking things from me. The moment I started to charge money for my coaching services, suddenly I had lo loads of clients because I said, this is valuable. My time is valuable and I'm not going to give it to you for free. Oh, oh, okay. And then it also filtered out the people who just want to complain and don't want to progress. Right. I think you need to do that too. And I, this is not advice specifically for you. It's advice for anyone who's building a community. You have to make people buy in. I'm building a community here in Portugal. Uh, you have to move here to get in the community that means you're going to have to give up wherever you're living we have a, a Swedish family moved here there's a few others thinking about it and the Swedish family they moved here to Portugal about a year ago um, at some point we'll end up finding an ideal piece of land and we'll all get on the same place yeah that's a show of commitment yeah exactly. if somebody... you must people make sure make people have a show of commitment if I ideally if I had a piece of land I would say, this is your little plot. You're going to build a house on there and you're going to sign an agreement that if you ever decide to move away, you cannot take your house with you and you have no ownership over it. The community owns your house. Now, does the community provide the resources for building the home, the materials? No, that, that, that buy, that's your buy-in. That's like, the buy-in. Okay. Yeah. In fact, um, ideally what you would do is they would do that and they would also contribute to the, I think you'd call it a folks house, the the um the community like the hall the main yeah, hall. The community hall yeah right. they would contribute to that and then beyond that people will contribute as they feel in their their heart to do that um and if you're providing people with value like if you had an actual location uh you could be much more demanding in what you're offering this is why i have i say that people who want to start up a community have to decide what are they offering um for example right by by my house they built a 200 unit closed micro community it was sold before all the units were sold before they started digging the holes in the ground to put the foundation why because they had something concrete to show people for it's ridiculous prices for this enormous price you could, you could buy a farm for the the cost that they're selling oh it's year. the same here in the united states yeah, yeah. Uh, par apartments are, are cra crazy prices uh for this apartment you will get um or for this much money you can have this apartment and it's closed and there's uh like pool tables in the basement that you can use and there's a pool that you can swim in with your kids and it's got a wall so no undesirable people will come in uh and you can you know let your kids run around without them being kidnapped and there's cameras everywhere and you can look at the cameras outside from your computer and you know they 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 have a whole suite of offers you have to decide what it is you're offering and you have to make people commit something of equal value, reciprocity. Right. It's the same as if we said, look, you can immigrate to our country. And eventually I want you to contribute something for that, you know, because my ancestors died for this and, you know, <laughs> they bled and died for this. And I've been paying taxes my entire life. And, you know, I'd like you to contribute something of roughly equal value. But first, we're going to let you come here and be a full citizen what's going to happen. People are going to go, Oh yeah, yeah, I'll contribute. Mm -hmm. Right. Then, they're they're going to come for the quote, free food and quote, and they're going to come for yeah. the free food. 
Yeah. Now imagine if you said, no, you want to move to our country? It's a hundred thousand dollar buy-in per adult, fifty for kids, and that's that's a bond. We're going to put that in, and we're going to invest it. It's a bond, and if you screw up, we keep the bond and kick you out if you don't follow the rules, you know, the the laws of the country. Right. Or I I want to hire some H one B visa people, and I'd say, well, you know, per personally, I just think you should end those programs, but. If you were going to say, okay, we're going to do it. Okay, but you you as the employer are responsible for them. And you're going to have to pay insurance so that if they commit any crimes, if they need to go on welfare in the future, if their kids need to go to school on the taxpayer dime, whatever it happens to be, you're, you as the employer are going to be responsible. So somebody needs to be responsible. If you're going to let people immigrate into your life, you got to make them buy in. I appreciate what you're saying from, you know, the Germanic standpoint, we're in agreement there, uh, but I'm going to play devil's advocate here because the resistance I'm going to come up against and, and have come up against in the past is why should, I'm just going to put myself in the position of that person, that, that prospect, why should I essentially pay money to buy into property that I don't own, that if I walk away from this, I, I can't get my money back, I can't get my property back. What's the incentive for me to buy in when I can just take that money and buy my own private house on my own private land, you know, with my wife or my sister or whomever, and, you know, I own that. If I choose to, to sell it or move away, I, I get my investment back, you know. Yeah. Now, in the old mineral <laughs> system, the um, people that would come to the manor didn't buy in with, with money usually. Uh, they would buy in with labor. The problem today is is that you, you probably don't need the kind of labor you need that would be necessary to make that type of a buy-in. Uh, so this is why you have to, to have people pay money, for example, to put up their own house. Now, this is why. You have two choices. You can live in this lovely multicultural community where your children will be going to school with people that you don't want within 100,000 miles of you. And you can have zero control over who you, moves into your neighborhood. You can have zero control over who your children are friends with, basically, because once they get out of the house, how do you know what they're doing when you can't see them? And uh, you can be raised around people that probably want you dead. Or, or you can come and live in this community. Now, if you're thinking, well, what if I want to leave? I'm not going to get my money back. We don't want people who are planning to leave. We want people who want to stay. And this right. is to convince you that that's what you should be doing. I agree with you. Um, I'm just looking now, at my now note. You could, always, okay. you could always say, okay, so I'm, I'm, living, I'm living in your community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a house in the city is going to cost me 500000 a house in your community has probably cost me a hundred at the most, you know, because I'm just, you know, when you, when you take a big plot of land and subdivide it, each division is very inexpensive. You're not paying a contractor to buy, build the house. You know, um, you're probably doing all the contracting work yourself. You, the very first people you want moving in are people that understand about construction. And uh, I want to leave. All I have to do is find another family recruit another family that's that is or another person if, it, if it's just a single individual that is compatible with the community and get them to take over my spot and give me some money okay yeah private transaction yeah i mean if you're thinking to move into the community and you have a house already done that would be a little easier you know you 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 don't oh and, and that would be in the contract that that would be allowed you'd, you'd have to okay. decide that because some places won't allow that although there's no way to pre exactly prevent it but if you if you say okay here's the community is going to have in the center of the community we're going to have a multi-residence building for people who don't have kids because well you don't need a three-bedroom house when you don't have kids so we're going to have a little one-bedroom apartments there and then around that will be the homes for the the families and that'll also be good for, you know, people who want to move out from home a bit or you have guests come. Maybe there's a few empty ones for the guests to stay in. You know, apartments are very cheap per unit to build. That's why people like building them. They're super profitable. They're cheap and you sell them for more than a house. Mm -hmm. And 
you can have that maybe it's 20, 30,000 to buy in for to, a, to an apartment there. Now, mind you, no bank will loan you money. You'll have to borrow money from friends and families and other people. But you're ensuring then that you get people who have a network. Right. Yeah, I, I think the biggest challenge to this, um, well, two, two challenges that um, I'm seeing, and this has been my experience, it's been my friend's experience. One, we and a lot of the people who we have come in contact with are cash poor, resource, resource poor. I mean, and we don't have a lot of control over that just because of the nature of how things are in the States. And, you know, we do the best we can. Um, and the other is the, the stock of prospects is also poor. Um, you know, my friend likened it to picking through a barrel of, you know, bruised apples, beat up apples, and trying to find the ones with the least amount of damage on them that are edible. And that, that's a horrible way to have to look at you know, human beings, but it, it's what we're dealing with. I mean, I know I sound desperate when I say this, but, you know, I personally have put a tremendous amount of effort and investment and, and applying strategies I thought were good and then later realized were not good um, to trying to, to build a tribe uh, for my own needs. But again, by, by virtue of doing that, it would serve the needs of others. And I've just been terribly unsuccessful. And uh, although I'm willing to try again, you know, I have the courage to do that. You know, I'm at a point, you know, where I don't know that I have the means to, to try again. Well, why don't you turn the trying part into something profitable? So okay, you have the ability to help people. So does your friend. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people that need help. Now those people, they don't have 10, you know, they don't have money maybe to create a village at the moment. Right. Maybe what you can do is you can say, okay, we're, we're going to start this, this tax-free uh, charity church. And what's going to happen is you're both going to be officiators at the church. And because of that, people, they need your help. They pay for your help. Like people pay for my help as, as a coach. And what's going to happen is you're going to start building up stronger people. But in exchange for that, they're going to come and ask you for your help no matter what. Right. So this, um, it's a reciprocal relationship. I get it. I get it. And now, and, now you, you told me before that you didn't, I think it was in this conversation that you, you didn't want to help people yet because you still had things to work out. Well, I'm going to be completely transparent with you. Um, well, first of all, both my friend and I are, are ministers um, within the Germanic faith. I'm legally ordained, so I've, I've already got that. Um, and we both have provided, you know, counsel to people who have asked it of us in the past. And I've provided that, and I think I've, well, I know I've provided value because I've gotten feedback uh, to that effect. Um, but because, and again, we can talk about my personal life offline, but because I'm not yet at a point where I, I'm, you know, where I should be. I'm not fit. I don't have all the agency that I should, I should have by my own standards. I don't feel qualified to, um, to put a shingle out there. Now, I, I have in the past, but I haven't gotten clients. And um, I don't know, may, maybe you can direct me in the right well, you've, path you've on that. Well, you've people to come to you to ask for help, right? A few, a few, not, not many. If you yeah. can get a few people, then from those, you can get more people. And okay. you, you can build it out as uh, like ripples. It'll, it'll build out. Um, the thing is, is that it's, it's like this. So the old way of doing schools before the public school system, the, you know, which is basically welfare for people that can't get work other places. Um, what would happen is, is high school, the teachers would teach 14 to, to 16 year old kids. I don't think they went to 18 back then, uh, 14 to 16 year old kids. Those kids, they didn't know a lot, but they knew enough to teach the 12 year old kids. The 12 year old kids didn't know very much, but they knew enough to teach the 10 year old kids. And so there was this filter down mechanism and al almost all the teaching was done by people who were in the learning process. The reality is, is nobody has it all figured out. You know, Ann Landers wrote relationship columns while she continuously got divorced over and over and over again, made, <laughs> loads, made millions and millions writing, you know, telling people how to make their relationship work while she's on her fifth divorce. I think she had like four or five divorces. Right. Now, I think that's an extreme case. You know, it's almost a display of incompetence. 
uh, rather than a, a display of a progression. You know, you're on a progression towards healthier and healthier. Mm -hmm. If I look at the man I was three years ago, and I look at the man I was six years ago and nine years ago, each time along the way, the man I am now could have given that other man great advice. Yes. I never, I'm never going to stop working towards my potential. There may come a time when I'm very old where I, it, it becomes difficult to take in new ideas, uh, although that for me will probably be when I'm dead. I'm going to take in ideas until then. But you can help the people who are not as far along as you are on the path. Understood. Even if you're not all the way to where you want to be. You'll, you'll never get to where you want to be because where you want to be, we'll, you'll just set a new goal farther ahead. Okay. So you would suggest, if I understand you correctly, that both my friend and I, since we've been counseling people, we, we should stop doing that for free immediately and start yes. charging. Okay. Yes. okay. Never do anything for free. It should always be reciprocal. That doesn't mean you charge money, but uh, in your case, you should. But you know, you help somebody, uh, you help somebody for charitable reasons. You have to understand this is charity and I'm not going to get anything back from them, but I get joy from helping them. Okay. Mm -hmm. The moment that the helping them is more work than the joy you're getting from helping them, it's no longer healthy for you to continue. You're exhausting your resources. One of the things I've noticed about Gen X's is that we were raised to look after our incompetent boomer parents yes yes and so we have this compulsion to help people and i had that too and you know you know why i started charging to help people why because i had a son and i no longer had time to spend 20 hours a week helping people for free and right. i said look i got a, I got a son i haven't slept in three days and you're like dinging me on facebook 10 times an hour for for help and i know you're desperate for help Look, I, I can't afford to take time off my work to help you, but if you paid me, I could help you. And people are like, yeah, sure, I'll pay you. I told them how much, and they said, that's too little. And so I told them a bigger number, and they said, that's too little. And, and my current clients are telling me I charge too little. So you, you start providing value and putting a number on it. It'll filter out the people who aren't really getting value out of your helping because they'll be like, mm, pain, it's not worth it because I'm, I'm just really here to complain. But all the people who want to make progress, by not charging, you're holding them back because you're not making them buy in. Right. If you're and, not and making you, them buy in, they're not, they're not going to follow through. You've, you've just made me aware of something. And um, it, maybe this is sort of a, a weakness within Europeans as a whole, you know, is our empathy. And um, certainly in the Germanic tradition, we have this ethic of a gift for a gift. And so if I give something to somebody, there's an implied expectation that they are obligated to now give something of equal measure in kind. And so when I'm dealing with these people, you know, I, I make myself available. If somebody wants counsel, they have questions, um, you know, I make myself reasonably available. And then I'm waiting, you know, for the return gift that never comes, and except it may come in the form of, you know, a thank you, of thank you, you've helped me so much. Okay, well, show me your thanks, you know, give me something of equal value. And sometimes I'll hear, well, you know, I hope in the future to be able to reciprocate. It's like, well, I kind of need the reciprocity now, you know, um, if you got the value now, then I should be getting the reciprocity now. Uh, and I think as Xers, not only uh, were we groomed to, um, as you said, sort of care for our, how did you put it? I, I want to use your language. We, we, were, we were groomed to be um, caretakers for our incompetent boomer parents. Yes. And, how many and, Xers are helping <laughs> parents figure out their finances while they can barely afford to pay like their students it, 20 years ago? It, exactly. And the byproduct of that is that we learned not to value ourselves. Mm -hmm. We don't value ourselves. That was why the light bulb. That's why so many Gen Xers get into codependent relationships. But that's what you're having with people if you're not making them be reciprocal. Yes, yes. You, you uh, need to be upfront about what reciprocity is for you. And you need to say, this is what I need. 
You know, if someone says to me, oh, I need some help, hey, you give them 30 seconds, five minutes of help. Sure. And then you tell them, look, this is too much for a couple of quick Facebook messages. We're going to have to have a real session. We're going to have to sit down and figure this out. Um, book, book a session here. You know, right. you, you, you know, you have questions about what it means. You're interested in what it means to become a pagan. Okay. I'd love to help you, but you know, I got, I got stuff to do. Um, I, I do have some time set aside though for paid clients. Would you like to join one of our courses? We have a group, uh, three or four people at a time, five people at a time. And we, we go through a, a 12 week program where we explain to the, you what it is so that you can decide if this is the path you want to take. But this allows you to make some commitment. Um, part of, part of the you know, reciprocity is really deeply ingrained into the European mind. The problem is, is that our altruism, we, we think so far into the future that we're okay with helping you this year because we know that like three years from now, you're going to help us. And that happens in the homogenous communities where everyone is somewhat related. They're all third cousins from each other in some small village in, the, in Northern Europe. Right. It doesn't work with random strangers on the internet. Right. And, and you're behaving from a place of honor, whereas most people don't know what that word means. Right. So you expect that they will honor you. You yeah. honor them by listening to their problem and helping them. And you expect they're going to honor you recipro recipro reciprocally by contributing something for that or some, you know, somehow helping, but they don't, they don't, they don't really know that's what's expected of them. And this is our fault because I used to do the same thing. This is our fault for not setting boundaries. You know, I don't blame illegal immigrants for coming for free stuff. I blame us for putting out free stuff for them to come for. And it's, you know, if we, we stop putting out the free stuff and we make the borders secure, we don't have problems with the illegal immigration. If we stop giving away free time and we make our boundaries of what was acceptable behavior to us clear, then we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna stop having a problem with people taking advantage of us. And that's so important for people to get. I mean, I know this doesn't apply uh, explicitly to Generation X. It, it applies to everybody. I, I think anybody who has come up during the boomer culture uh, as a whole we have terrible boundaries. I mean, we were raised that way. Um, again, not just by the parents, but by the culture, you know, to just be permissive with ourselves uh, when it comes to anything, sex, food, cons consumption of any kind of resource, and um, just allowing people to impose upon our time without demanding fair value for that. So I think a lot of your listeners are going to gonna get, get something out of what you just said. That's great. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think we're, we're, we've been at it for quite a while now. Yeah. And about, I, think, I think this is a subject we can come back to um, help okay. for Xers based on whatever questions come out of the, the viewers from this. Um, I think that, you know, to, to recap, Gen, Gen Xers were red pilled, you know, 30 plus, most of them, some of them closer to 40 when they were red pilled. Uh, that's when the general red pilling swept across the world. And you know, if you get red pilled at 15 and you get red pilled at 35, that's a huge difference, especially for a woman. If you're a man, you get red pilled at 35. It's a little different. You can go look for a young wife. If you're a woman and you're 30, 35 and you get red pilled, um, you, you just realize things that you've been lied to on subjects which have a limited time. Your fertility is disappearing, all this. And so the challenges that generation Xers are facing are unique. Um, individuals, the, you, each individual has their own unique challenges, but there is a, a shared difficulty in that. And I think the boundaries that we mentioned at the end of this conversation are the number one place that those of generation X especially need to work on. I actually find that younger generations are getting boundaries back again. Um, they are learning from us just the way we learn from the boomers. And we need to have those boundaries in all aspects. Boundaries with ourselves as part of having agency is setting boundaries. I will not do this thing. 
and then having the control not to do it, or I will do this thing, and then having the control to force yourself to do it when you need to. Um, but we also need to have those boundaries with others, making sure people aren't taking advantage of us, making sure we're not replaying the toxic relationship we had with our boomer parents with every other person we meet. And that's, that's a huge part of it. You know, letting people take advantage of us is replaying that, that, uh, that, those, those toxic relationships. So I really appreciate you coming to me with these questions, um, Haythorn. And I think that uh, this is going to be an excellent conversation to help a lot of Generation Xers and others as well. And anytime that you'd like, we can revisit this. Um, let's let it have a couple of weeks for people to ask questions and then we'll see what, what, um, what further follow-up we might do. Okay. Sure. Th thank you so much for taking the time and taking this topic. Uh, it means a lot to me personally, and I know it's going to mean a lot to the folks that I'm in regular conversations with and probably many more folks out there who watch your, uh, watch your videos and visit your website. So thank you so much. I'm grateful. Excellent. Thank you very much. And if you're watching, please subscribe and like the video. And you can also sign up to my newsletter at smv4k.com. You'll find it at the bottom of the page. Uh, if you're on the first page, it's an infinite scroll. So you'll have to you know, go into one of the uh, articles and you'll find the, the newsletter. Newsletter is especially important in case we get shut down. We've been brigaded recently by feminists and other assorted wackadoodles. And uh, it's possible that we could lose our social media or even be shut out of one of our websites. So if you're part of the newsletter, then I have a list of your emails and I'm able to get a hold of you 